Welcome to the future, you guys. Hello, beautiful people. We are live on Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitch. We're back. Who's this guy standing right next to me? <laughs> Who's this guy in the booth, in the hot box, if you will? This is Hugh Barton. And Hugh Barton is a licensed psychotherapist. He's had a very interesting career path into becoming a psychotherapist. I want to share that with you, but mostly, you guys see me on a weekly basis. I'm giving you guys advice on things, and I'm an amateur. Now I feel a little intimidated because he was here and he's got a lot of tools and techniques and we're going to get into that. Those of you guys that are watching, we're, we're going to have Molly, Aaron, and Erica be monitoring comments. I'm going to be monitoring comments as well. So we invite you to join us in this dialogue. Let's say hello quickly to the Dream Team. Hey guys, what's going on? Happy Wednesday. Hey guys. Happy Wednesday. Really excited for this episode. Excellent. Can't wait, Hugh. Aaron, double Can't. thumbs up, and he's like leaning back on <laughs> yeah, the wall. Yeah, look, Aaron's all too cool for school too today. Cool. <laughs> Ergo, how's it going? It's going well. I'm a little tired, but I'm I'm interested to see what what happens to here today. Okay, excellent. Let's uh, let's cut back to me. Okay, so guys, a new way to open the show. We're gonna say we're gonna keep it real. We're gonna keep it raw. And we're back. Great job, guys. Okay, you guys are confirming that people are hearing us on the internet. We're we, loud uh, and clear. Everyone's Our saying mics hi. Are loud. Yes. Everybody's saying hi. Excellent. Okay. Cool. Hi. So the first question <laughs> I have for you, Hugh, is yeah. your path to becoming a therapist. Tell us that story. Well, w you and I go back a ways. We do. Because we met when Sean Holt and I were starting our own music company, and we were starting to work on projects together where we did the music and sound design, and you did all the the CGI and the graphic work. Right. But my path before that was, in a nutshell, uh, I started playing drums at six in New York City and then switched to piano. And then through high school and college, worked really hard practicing all the time. Eventually, we, we can talk about this later, but I got scared to be a musician professionally. So I finished up my degree at School of Visual Arts in New York City. SVA. SVA as a designer. So I worked in design and I worked for a type shop for two years when they still had those wait, things. Wait, when you say designer, you mean like graphic design? Graphic design. Oh my God. So yeah. you're you're a multifaceted person with many skills. So you're a musician, but you didn't want to do that because you were scared. Yeah. And then you went to SVA to study graphic design. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is getting interesting. I didn't know all these things yeah. about you. Okay, yeah. keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So what happened was I, I did that for about three years, but I love type. So I worked for a type shop in New York City when they still had those things. <laughs> Back in the day, now of course it's an ancient relic, and nobody knows what. When that you say is. a type shop, is that like letterpress or printing company? So what does that mean? Back in the day, ad agencies didn't have their own Max, no such oh, thing. I see. So if you wanted a headline and body copy, you sent out your copy to a type shop, mm -hmm. and like I worked on the specking desk where you'd spec the copy. Mm -hmm. Somebody would be in the darkroom typositoring the headline and all that. So back in the day, before computers, that's how type got done, so and I loved type it. Setting. Type setting. Beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. Back in the day. I just love type design. So while music is going on, um, in the background of that, my mother was an art director on Madison Avenue. So behind all the music and the design work, I would hang out with her friends at ad agencies. So this was the 60s and the 70s, remember. So it was the Mad Men era. So I got a real good taste of what are, what are these creatives like at agencies? So when it came time out of college and out of working in design for a couple of years to get back to music, it seemed a natural link to say, what about music for commercials? Mm. I know something about agency life. I know something about commercials. I know something about music. So my path eventually took me back to music, which I did for probably 25 years. So that was the first half of life issues. The first half of life love was music and design and type. And along the way, I also was a chef or a cook in a Mexican <laughs> restaurant. What have you not done? Well, it, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but all of these creative endeavors spin back into psychotherapy. There's a lot of parallels that we can talk about, Okay. which we'll, we'll get to if you want to. And, yeah. and again, today, I'm hoping this could be like a jazz improvisation where questions come in, topics come up. I don't want it scripted or planned. I just want it to be free form and... That's the nature of the show. Okay. And our audience is well aware of how we do it. Okay, good. There's no seatbelt. There is no instruction manual. We're just going to dive right in. Great. So let me just kind of map out what you just said. So you're, you're a musician. You love music, but you decided to study graphic design and pursue that. And you worked as a topographer for some time yeah. before realizing there's this whole other world in, in commercial advertising. So for the next 20 years or so, you wound up doing sound design and music for 
big ad agencies and commercials, right. TV spots, essentially. Exactly. Okay, so now something happened between then and then you deciding to get your degree exactly. in psychotherapy. Exactly. What happened there? So what here's, was the trigger? So here's what happened, which, which now that I'm in practice, I see a lot of uh, creative people in the second half of life going through the same thing, which was I always identified myself, Chris, as a, um, a composer and a sound designer and a creative person. And as the industry shifted and the marketing factors changed and original music wasn't quite as interesting anymore, uh, my identity as a creative person started to tank. Our income at mm. my company has also started to drop off and my, um, basically I entered a depression because I fell away from the identity that I thought I was. And so I spun out and by going into depression, I tried to start reaching around and grabbing the things that are going to help. And one of the things that helped was going to therapy. So as I did therapy more and more, I took an interest in it. And then I went back to a first grad program for counseling. And every time I did it and helped with myself, I thought, I wonder if I could do this for a living. Oh, it wow. just came about that easy. I could not have planned it. It wasn't a matter of willpower or imagination at that point. It was just a matter of, as I did this therapy thing as a client, I started realizing, I like this. And as I took a step to look at school or I took a step to look at, um, uh, talk to more therapists, I noticed that I, I had more and more interest. And as I took a step in each direction, it was more fun and more meaningful the more I did it. Okay. So at some point, something popped in my head and said, can I do this for a living? And then again, every step led me to think, you know what, doing psychotherapy is fun and meaningful. Now you're a good looking man, but you mentioned 60s and 70s, so our audience yeah. is thinking, mm. and I'm gonna ask you this question and feel free to say, no, I don't wanna go there. All right. How old were you when you decided, you know what, this is my second, third career arc. When did you make that decision? How old were you? 48. Wow. Yeah. That's gutsy. <laughs> It was gutsy. That's really gutsy because there's a lot of people in our audience who say, who ask me, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm yeah. 50. Is it too late for me to start my career? It's not too late. It, it, the thing I would say too is somebody like Carl Jung started to recognize working in clinics and his own practice that there's first half of life issues which are about birth to 35. And then there's second half of life issues that start around 35 and go up. So it's almost as if I was exactly on line with the developmental issues that somebody needs in the second half of life. Mm. Is, is this what people also refer to as your like midlife crisis? Yeah, exactly. And so it happens somewhere between 35 and uh, some other age. Yeah, usually between 35 and 50 yeah. is the most common age that I've seen. So when I'm 51 and I've passed that, then I'm okay. <laughs> like I know I'm not going to have a midlife crisis. The questions may fall away and won't be so stressed anymore. That's kind of what nature does for us. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. I got a couple more years to hang on there, you guys, until I hit 51, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll be clear of this, this hurdle that we got to get through. Yeah. Okay, so w the way it sounds to me is that you were in a funk, in a state of depression, your own words yeah. there, not mine, Yeah. and you got some help. And that really turned you on. You're like, wow, this is really cool. I'm getting helped, but I wonder if this is something that I myself could do. Yeah, that's how I went. That's the path that I went in. That's great. So how many years of school did you go to before you, you became a licensed uh, psychologist? So I did a two-year master's program in counseling psychology, which was like the appetizer, the mm. amuse-bouche to the actual mm. profession. And after that, I realized that there was a calling for me in it. So I went back to school for second master's in actual a license program. So that was two years and then the three-year program plus the internships, it was about, let's say, five and a half years. Okay. Start to finish. So five and a half years later. Yeah, here we here are. You are. Here we are. And you've been a practicing psychotherapist now for how long? I've only been licensed about two years. Oh, great, great. So I've been practicing technically since 2008. All right. But licensed recently. So all the people out there who are entering midlife and wondering, now what do I do? Is anything else possible? I can tell you that it is. All right. This is a great primer for our discussion and for you guys as a jumping in point. I'm going to ask you this question that people in our community, the creative community, which I would say is your community as well. And this is where I think you have some unique things as, uh, as a former creative person in both design and music and composition, sound design, and now you're helping people. So I, I think you're going to see patterns here more so than maybe some other psychotherapists and you can 
I think definitely empathize with some of these issues. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue I keep hearing about is this, is that creative people, we're people pleasers. We do the things that we do because we're just, we're just, we yearn for that little compliment that a, that a client's gonna throw at us. They, that was brilliant. You do amazing work. You're yeah. amazing. Yeah. And we're willing to trade a lot for that little moment. Yeah. We're willing to trade sleep, personal time, personal development, our own sanity sometimes. We're willing to trade money and so this issue of guilt over money and the association of charging money for something that you're kind of hardwired to do, how does somebody come overcome that, this idea of guilt, this idea of having mm. imposter syndrome? I don't want to load this question up too much yeah. uh, so that we can have more of a dialogue around it. So is that something, that's, is that enough for you to kind of jump in? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. It's something I see in the clinic all the time. Okay. Um, I guess a place to start is the difference between self-confidence and self-esteem. There's a difference? Yeah. Okay, so now, now so, what, so, what is it? Yeah, so this is the difference. Um, self-confidence is how we, we feel about our own abilities. So if we were in a closet writing music, doing sound design, doing graphic design, putting together a dish, it would be no issue. We would have a sense of our strengths and weaknesses. We would do our strengths. We would avoid our weaknesses. Or we would seek help in getting better at the things we don't do well. So left on our own, confident self-confidence would be how we feel about our own abilities in our own skin, in our own room. By ourselves. By ourselves, okay. typically. I'm going to make some notes here. Keep going. Okay, so self-esteem typically is how we feel about our abilities in the face of other people. And typically we learn that in the first half of life um, when we have to compete for jobs. So my f scare that I got about music was not a self-confidence issue. It was self-esteem because I started playing around out of high school and seeing what other keyboard players were able to do. And my self-esteem started to get shaky. Oh. I still had confidence in how I approached the piano or the synth or the guitar or composition. But my self-esteem comparing myself to others in the marketplace was not very good. And that's where the fear came in. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I, well, you're kind of changing my whole perspective on this. I need a moment to process this. Yeah. Surround other people, that's called self-esteem because we're comparing ourselves and other people are possibly judging us or we perceive them to be judging us. Yeah, and that's an old Adlerian term. Adler was a student of Freud, but he turned the, he turned the phrase uh, self-esteem because there was a two-way street. It was what we did to ourselves in the face of other people who do the same thing, and it was the kind of feedback and mirroring we got from people around us. Okay, well, I'm going to take a moment here. I'm going to ask Molly and company as uh, a couple, he's, he was mentioned a couple of people, Carl Jung, and this other person, say his name again? Adler. Adler, that you okay. should be cutting to the Wikipedia or okay. something, and then I'm we looking. should be cross-cutting, okay? Adler. I mean, we're two good-looking gentlemen. I, I get it. We're kind of silver foxes, more, more so him than me. But we want to cut away from time to time to these graphics because we, we have an international audience. Okay. Right? Molly, wait. So wait. Adler. Ad, Adler? Is there a, more to that name? Maybe type in therapist. Okay. I forget his first name. Okay. Gerard or Gerhard or okay. someone in this field. You would know yeah. Molly. Yeah. Okay. And while and Carl and, Jung. Carl Jung. Okay. J U N G. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just to help out our international audience in case we're saying something that they don't understand, they always ask us for references while we're talking. Nice. So great. Let's cut back to us. Okay. Uh, and when Molly's ready, just cross cut whenever you want. Okay. We okay. won't be distracted by that. But we had to do this in a timely manner. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I got it. All right. Thanks. Okay. Let's keep going here. So this idea of comparison, we've talked about this on other shows. That that's what starts to tweak us. Now, do you find that most people, when they're left alone, their confidence is quite high, or is it similar when we're the self confidence versus self esteem? Like, mm. does my self esteem drop precipitously when I'm entering and being around other people? That's an interesting question. I think that there's a, how would I say, we interject how other people feel about us, and that creates lasting effects. It's almost like an imprint, you know, a thumbprint or an imprint of some kind. So if we get enough negative feedback, we have an interdict that says, you're no good at this. If we get enough positive feedback, we might think, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. If it's neutral, then on our own, we might be okay. But you could see where it gets very insidious that the the power of the relationship that we have early on from the caregivers, from our parents, from other people who influence us, could be piano teachers. 
A soccer coach. Soccer coaches, all that. Some somebody out there, when we're very impressionable, yeah. has implanted an idea about our own self esteem. Yeah. They've either said you're really good, you're amazing, you have a lot of talent, yeah. or they say the opposite, which is you could do more. I'm disappointed in you. Yep. You're not living up to your potential. All those kinds of things. Exactly. And you did a a, a a show like this a couple of days ago where you talked about the negative introject, we would call it. You had this negative voice inside from somewhere. Mm-hmm. And it was clear that it was in Chris, but it wasn't from Chris. Right. And now... The inner voice. Yeah, the inner voice. So in mm-hmm. therapy, one of the things we try to do is discern what's from Chris and what isn't from Chris. So what are some of the tools that you use to figure that out? Because the natural response is, of course... All the voices in my head are my own. Of course, they are. They're they're in my voice. Yeah. So, how, what are some tools? How do you decide? How do you discern? There's that? a lot of different ways. If I'm working with a creative person, I might um, either do active imagination or give assign homework to do an art project. Let's say. So I've got a couple of designers and artists. So I might say, I want you to draw that negative voice you hear. I want you to do it in the fullest detail you can. And then once you've drawn it, I want you to interact with it. So it's a real part of me. I want you to have a conversation with it. And next time you come back, we're going to talk about what you talked about. And we actually can do a gestalt process where we're going to have an open chair. You're going to actually talk to that part of yourself. You're going to switch chairs. You're going to be that negative voice. So if it's your father's voice or your mother's voice, and you get a chance to work it in that process, and what usually happens is you get to see that there's a Chris or a Hugh and there's a voice and they're not the same thing. Oh. Then you have some hand in crafting the kind of life you want or the kind of responses or the kind of creativity you want. Now, it takes a while. That's part of the reason why therapy can be so slow is we have lots of defenses not to go there, not mm-hmm. to host that negative voice. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, you're, you're dropping some big $6 words here, and oh. I just want to make sure that everybody gets it. He said Gestalt, Carl Jung, or Jungian, yeah. and then the interject. Did you say the interject? Interject, yeah. Woo! Sorry. Molly, are you keeping up with yeah, us? Yeah, I'm trying to. I can't spell <laughs> You can't go the fast stalt. enough. We, we need G-E-S. G- uh, we need literate people on the oh, show. Okay, what is there going you go. on, Molly? Yeah. You're falling apart on it. I, I got it. I, got I can it. explain them if you need me to. No, it's okay. Interject just means that it's something we've taken in and digested. You, you're going to have to zoom in, Molly, because we can't see squattily boosh okay, right okay. now. Okay. Uh, Erica, let's not cut her until she's ready. She'll give you a signal as to when she's ready. She'll point to you or something. You guys, work on your communication out there, please. Okay. Okay, let's go. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people commenting. The, the, the internets are going a little wild right now. A little wild. And my boy, uh, Arun, is back, Scientist X. People are wondering where the heck he was. He's there. People are saying, Don't we, isn't it all natural we all seek external praise? How would you respond to that? Um, for, for a time. For a time. Yeah. I think when you're young, you need it to build a self. You could say okay. to build. You're kind of an open uh, well, slate or an empty uh, slate. Or you're a, not a blank slate. Well, you're so not okay. a tabula rasa, as they would say. You're not a blank table. You're not okay. a blank slate. You have your own temperament, which we can talk about. You have your own personality. And anybody who's a father knows if you have multiple kids, they are not blank slates. Right. But early on, it helps if the caregiver can mirror back the person's essential goodness things they do well, things they know how to host. It's great if a caregiver or parent can especially host emotions with a person. So if a lot of your audience was like me, the message I got when I shared a difficult emotion, like I'm angry, I'm afraid, my response from my caregivers was, well, don't feel that. Oh, they shut it down. Shut it down. So what do I do as a five-year-old or a three-year-old? I say, well, I guess all emotions must be off the table. Or I can only share positive emotions when I've uh, won at a sporting event, when I've done something well, when I'm happy. So you're being unconsciously or uh, unintentionally trained to shut down all negative emotions. That's, that was how I did it. Right. Not everybody. Did it. Some people fight back. Some people push back. Some people become very aggressive. My path or my temperament, which is introversion, tended to shut down and go inside and say, there must be something wrong with me. Because she's the she's the mother and she knows it all. She's so if all she's, she's a, so if yes. she says that's not okay, I must it must not be okay. Mm. Of course, part of us knows it still is in there and it still wants to be worked and held and nourished and appreciated. So as an adult, you carry this imprint, right? The imprint that you talked about. I'm using your language yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. I'm yeah. a quick study yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, good. You carry right the imprint, here. 
And you don't even know anymore that that was things that were planted in you at, right. at a very young age. So as an adult now, you're suppressing these emotions. Yeah. And anytime you feel that, you feel like I must be defective. Something is wrong. Like right. this is normal and this is abnormal. Yeah. And yeah. how long did you carry this and how did it manifest itself in your life? Can you give us one or two examples? I mean, we're going deep here, you guys. So if the waterworks start happening, I mean, we're, we want to share with you guys an open and transparent manner. So yeah, and I'm, if my waterworks come up, it's going to happen. Okay, so it's going to happen. It's Let's fine it. with me. Let it Nothing go. will happen for me. I've tried. They've all, the, the tear ducts have dried. But okay. <laughs> Molly will cry for both of us. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying it will. But okay. <laughs> uh, I started noticing in my relationships to women that there was, I was projecting onto them, meaning I was putting on to needs that my mother didn't give me. Ooh. So I'd put a need of, I need to be constantly here. You did a good job. Uh, oh. you're, you're a good boy. You did great on that music piece. You're so wonderful. I so appreciate you doing that. And so I started realizing how much I needed that at the beginning. And it didn't really sit well with my mates because that's a lot of pressure. They've got their own life to deal with. And now they're trying to field my emotional minefield for me. That's not fair. Mm. But I started noticing that things became very difficult in relationship because I wanted from them things I didn't get. But for years and years, I don't know that's happening. I just right. know that it's not working until I turn back to therapy and try to seek out somebody as, who's an expert in the field and they start pointing out, well, here's how these things work and here's what happens. So, I mean, at this point in my life, I, I'm not ashamed to admit I think I've been in therapy for more than 20 years. Is, is this with Joan? By the I started with Joan. Started Joan with John. wasn't the first one either. We have a shared therapist. Yeah. <laughs> I think you recommended or somebody. Yeah. We all share the same yeah. people. And this is a little sidebar here, guys. My, my business coach, Kier McLaren, a person I've talked to for, about on the show many, many times. He's been on the show and you guys know who he is and how he's made an imprint on my life. Well, this is the guy who introduced, Hugh Barton is the man who introduced me to Kier McLaren. It was mm -hmm. over yeah. lunch over at Frito. That's Mister. right. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. You, you were so open in sharing and I appreciate for you for that. And it's just, it's been amazing. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to have yeah. you on the show. And this whole kind of career arc where we knew each other first as creative collaborators. And now you're into this world in, in psychotherapy, something I'm very interested in. Because oftentimes I give advice to our audience. I tell them, yeah. this is what you need to do. Here's how you do the bid. And this is what you tell the client. But underneath all of that, the thing that seems to be holding them back very consistently across the board, whether you're from America or some parts of Asia or South America, it's always the mindset, that imprint, the thing that you carry with you, mm. the thing that's holding you back. And so if there's tools that we can uncover today, things that maybe, maybe aren't the total answer, but a, a pointing of people in a direction as to where they can go to get help, I think that would be very productive of our conversation together. Yeah, well, there's a lot here. I am We're not gonna be able to do this on TV for but an I, hour. But I'll say this, hour. I'll say this. Um, if people start noticing consciously what is happening when they're around somebody else, if you could start noticing, you know, whenever I'm around that person, I feel really nervous or I feel really I know angry. that feeling. Yeah, yeah, I totally know that feeling. <laughs> So it starts, uh, especially if you're not a feeling type, and again, we can talk about typology because I think it's important. If you're not a feeling type, the question is, well, how do I know what I'm feeling? So one easy way in is, do I like that or I do, do I not like that? Oh, okay. And then if you don't like it, for instance, you could say, well, how am I feeling? I don't like it, but how am I feeling? And you might notice you feel hurt or you feel angry. Uh, you feel scared, you feel envious. You could start noticing how do you, you don't like something or a person and what's underneath the preference or the, the dislike. And you could start noticing and hosting the emotional qualities that you notice in yourself. So that's a starting point to start getting some consciousness around what is your experience. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yeah. And this yeah. is totally vibing on the things that I've been advising people on yeah. in that I say when you're not feeling confident or you're feeling really confident take note of the people that you're around what circumstances and situation yeah. are you around that kind of change your energy level right now I, I think there's what I've seen and having been on this side of the ad world and creating music and sound design and working with you is there's usually three levels one is uh, the bosses you work under so there could be a father-mother thing happening between you and the perceived uh, senior person. Then you've got colleagues, could be like brother and sister issues. And then you've got 
underlings or subordinates who report to you, and you can start noticing that you may treat all three kinds of people differently. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. So there's a kind of a mapping onto a family structure. Yeah. Hmm. So your boss is typically the you somehow associate with your mom and your dad. Right. It could it could be and now different yeah. people are different. So, you know, one person who's working at a company could always be angry at the boss. They're always assuming that the boss is going to be cutting them down at the knees or backstabbing them because that's the environment they grew up in at home. And so one thing you can start doing if you're a person like that is start noticing that you have a lot of anger and aggression towards the boss. And you can start discerning, is it in response to a real threat or am I bringing this on when there is no real threat? So you could start discerning consciously what's happening here. Mm. So the same thing with colleagues who we could say at your level or how you treat people who are under you. That's something that I've heard too. I think Kira has told me this thing where in a situation, if it's a client yeah. that you barely know and they say something, you get this emotional reaction and you're actually not reacting to that person. Yeah. You're reacting to your father or your mother yeah. at a time in which you're kind of, you, you could not stand up for yourself. So the way that you're standing up for yourself is you act it out on somebody that's new in a relationship, yeah. in a personal relationship or a professional relationship or a boss or somebody. Right. And you're, you're acting out things from the past. Right. So how do you... First of all, what are the signs that you're doing that? And then how do you start to deal with that so that you're being fair to the person that's in front of you? Well, here it, here's where it gets a little tricky because um, the old boys, talking about Freud and Jung, they noticed that a lot of our defensive moves are unconscious. We're not aware of doing these things. So it wouldn't be possible, per se, for a person on their own to notice what they're doing. Oh. This is where having an ally or husband or wife who, who knows about this, or a therapist is helpful because you can't really do it on your own. It's unconscious. If I project anger about my father on a boss, I don't know I'm doing it for a very long time. Maybe when I'm 50, 60, it starts dawning on me that it's, it can't be the other person all the time. But when we're younger... Okay, okay so you're seeing patterns then maybe. You start noticing that you seem to get angry over, let's say, at bosses. Right. It, it's... In my experience, it's best if you don't try to do this alone because you don't know you're doing. You just think the other person's a jerk. You don't. Right. You don't know that you're projecting. You don't know it's your fantasy about this person, which has nothing to do with the actual person. But if you start noticing that things are falling apart, if you're at a crossroads where relationships are falling apart, work is hard to find, you keep getting fired, or you're really dissatisfied. If you can get the, the help of somebody who's trained in this and knows about this, uh, it's, it's really beneficial. Mm. Plus, I don't think we're meant to do this work alone anyway. Right. Just like we're not meant to be children alone. We need people there to show us how to be a self and how to grow a self and you know, how to, what we're good at and how to deal with emotions. We need a model for how to do that. So mm -hmm. same thing in this, in this case. Now, our audience is very diverse. We have some young people, I would say around 16 years old, and some even younger than that. And mm -hmm. we have some people way over 40. And they're all over the world. So some people are not going to have access uh, because of just physical access to, to go and see somebody to get a coach. Or, and yeah. then there's problems with resources. So here's what I'm hearing. So if you're wherever you're at in the world right now, if you start to have an interaction with somebody and you start to feel out of your normal state. Right. So if your normal state is just chill or it's angry, but something is causing you to go left or right of that, just first take a moment to become aware that you're feeling something a little funny. Well said. A little odd. Well said. Okay, well so then, said. then exactly. the, it is to kind of be in the moment, of course, continue to dialogue with the person and become very aware. Like, I am starting to feel, fill in the blank, afraid, nervous, yeah. betrayed, yeah. scared, angry. And then to take account for that and to say, okay, all right, and I'm going to audit myself here and say, okay, I'm seeing something. First of all, I don't like it. None of us wants to be miserable, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. And if you're starting to feel a little funky, and at least then make a note of it. Now, you may not know what to do with it, but make a note of it and just keep no notating that. And maybe over That's time, good. you can start to start to analyze it yourself. But obviously, this is not stuff that it's easy to figure out on your own. Yeah, I, I think you can do it with family and friends as well. You can just start discussing, you know, I notice when this happened that instead of staying in equanimity, staying balanced and just myself, I started getting pulled to be really angry and I don't know why this happened. And you can talk about it with friends, with family, with 
parents with you know you could you could open it up for discussion okay as well you don't have to seek out a professional my bias of course is that if you do yeah uh we we are trained for long periods of time in noticing all the variations of what that is okay you know so i'm going to share a real world example and you tell me if i'm exhibiting some of these things or not okay there, i was having a conversation with uh, a very senior level person in our team and the conversation was getting really hostile really, really fast. And this is a subordinate of mine, somebody that works for me. I am clearly their boss while running this company. Okay. And the energy level is getting really funky and I can see their, their, the way that they spoke, uh, the, 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 the words that they used, they were clearly very upset, quite angry. And I'm trying to be that kind of boss where I'm just even killed yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And I said out loud, I recognize that this conversation is heading in a direction that is unpleasant. I don't think it's going to be productive for us to continue this dialogue because we both might say something we're going to regret and not be able to take back. My suggestion is for us to end this call now, to sleep on it, and revisit this conversation tomorrow. Was it a phone, it was a phone call? It was a phone call. Okay. It was a crazy call. Yeah. At, late in the night, too. So it was, it was urgent. It was dramatic. All those kinds of things. And this person proceeded to say to me, No, we will have this call right now. I need you to hear me. I said, Okay, do this at your own peril. And they continued to talk. And then at some point, they got so flustered. We're talking about like temper tantrum level frustration and flust being flustered. They're like, Whoa. Okay, you're right. Let's end the call now. And then bye and just hung up. Okay, so what I was trying to do without the training that you've had yeah. is to say, I'm aware that something's going on here and I'm aware that two of us are going to go do something that it's not going to be good. And I'm also aware that I have a lot of power in this relationship. So I'm trying my best to not let this person commit virtual suicide in front of me. Because in the world that I come from, we can have lots of disagreements, but please talk to me in a tone that is respectful. There's a big thing in, in the culture that I grew up and the, the imprint that I was given. Respect is kind of a big thing. Yeah, It's a very big thing. You can yeah. say lots of things, but when you disrespect me, then we have problems. So was I taking an audit of where I was emotionally and communicating that out loud? Or you, you give me some advice on how to deal with that situation or any analysis. I, I mean, what happened after the call? I mean, what, what, was, out, what was the outcome oh. of your experiences and your sharings and your conversation? It, it, the outcome was very negative, one of two of us. Okay. Well, do, do you want to talk about this, about this client right now? It's yeah. not a client. It's, it's, we can talk about whatever. Okay. I, I'm, I, I'm open I, to okay. sharing. Yeah. Um, when the person was tantruming, how old emotionally would you say they were? Seven. Okay, so now you're talking to a seven-year-old. How do you talk to a seven-year-old? Probably the same way, like a parent. Okay, and how do you do that? Do you do you same. set down the law? Do you yeah. ask questions? How do you? No, do I lay down okay. the law at this okay. point. Yeah. Um, For a seven-year-old, and I'm I'm imagining my own child here, and they're both older now, but when they were seven, and still to this day, when they're acting in a way that is. Um, very emotional. I will say to them, you're having an emotional moment right now. I recognize that. Uh, I'm, I'm not ready to continue this conversation. When you feel like you want to re-engage, I'm here for you, but I'm not going to respond to this. Well, there's an alternative to that. Please, so sometimes share with me. if if you because in my mind right now, I'm like, that's it. That's the only answer I have. Well, so share with me. Well, I think you want to have the ability, even with a client who's a grown person but emotionally is tantruming at seven years old, to have. Um, uh, curiosity and meet them where they are. So if a seven-year-old is tantruming, tantruming, what you actually might do is you'd, you'd pick up the seven-year-old and say, I hear you. What's going on right now? Tell me more. You'd, you'd put your best Columbo jacket on and say, oh. what's happening right now? What, what did I say? You know, what did you hear me say? What does it feel like right now? You'd, you'd actually try to enter their world. And if you could do that for a short period of time, I mean, this person might have never been heard by their parents. And here is a vendor taking an interest there in their emotional life. And, you know, this could be a 10-minute call, an hour call. It mm. could be three minutes. But all of a sudden, the seven-year-old's getting heard and accepted and there's openness for this. And one way to do that is be curious about their own experience. Meet them where they are. 
So one parenting style, I think, is to say, here's the law. This is not going well. Let's just cut this off. Obviously, I'm getting angry. You're getting angry. Maybe it's best if we don't do this. Or, and I'm just riffing here. I like it. You could say, what's going on right now? Sounds like you're really angry. Are you angry at me? Yeah, tell me more. Ooh. Yeah, that must be really frustrating. Molly's God, what was right I now. like? Yeah. What was that like yeah. for you when I said that? What did you hear me say? And you're not doing it facetiously to put them in their place. You're, you're trying to be like a good mother, to, to be curious about meeting them where they are. You have kids? No. Oh. <laughs> no. I don't. You should. Is, no, you no, should no, 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 no. This is all theory then, because I'll tell you exactly what's gone on uh, before. This is good. This okay. is very good. All right. Molly's really digging this, by the way. She loves this deep stuff. Okay. 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 Now, when, when I've done this, and I, I really appreciate this other option. And I do use this option quite often. And almost always, this is my default standard when it comes to dealing with a client. Because I understand something about hierarchy. I understand that when the client is upset and you argue with them, no matter if you win, you lose. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. We're talking about a subordinate, somebody who works for me, kind of mouthing off to me, telling me what time of day it is. And it's it's hard. It's hard to stop and switch over to this it is. Where is this? Ang- Are you angry at me? No, you don't say I, it like that. You don't have. You should do it do you as Chris. It? You just. You don't have to fake uh, a caring mother. <laughs> yeah. You don't do the fake. Uh, oh, I'll. I'll have to be uh, some good enough mother. You don't do that. <laughs> okay. You just stay yourself. I did that for effect. I wouldn't ever. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I did it for effect. You just stay. Right. You just stay yourself and be curious about their experience. So, so in therapy, this happens all the time. We can see that somebody hits a crossroads and they're not getting the mirroring they had hoped they had gotten early on. Yeah. And quite often, it's a matter of can you meet the person exactly where they are? So if they're tantruming, you go into it with them. What does it feel like? How's it going? Now, I have a different perspective than you do because I'm not their boss and this is right. not a graphic design company. Right, it's right. not CGI. Mm-hmm. It's a different set of rules, you right. can say. You're in it to try to help coach somebody through the problem. Yeah. And I get that. These are yeah. all, uh, no matter what, if you agree or disagree, these are all tools and you kind of have to think for yourselves, you guys, like what's going to work for me? What's going to help me in my situation? So if you've been taking my approach, which is I'm the law and this is the way it's going to be and it's not working out for you, you might try this more empathetic approach and try to understand them at their level. And there's another another approach that I use, especially with creative people, because they can be so symbolic in imagery. Mm-hmm. It can be imaginal, as we say. Mm-hmm. I might ask you, what kind of animal is this guy? What would you say? What kind of animal is he? Uh, at this moment in time, I, I think. Mm. A baboon. All right, so <laughs> how would you interact with a baboon? <laughs> I'd stay away from the baboon. All right, so, so exactly, wild. exactly. So there may be nothing to be done right now if the baboon is wild. Yeah. Now the other question is, what kind of animal are you in this conversation? A hippo. <laughs> or so you got a hippo and a. <laughs> that's quite a big contrast. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just throwing it out. There. Right, right. You know what a hippo does? He just sits in water. His ears <laughs> flap, and you know. The All right, but a hippo has great patience. It has a tremendous capacity for hosting and staying still. So if you imagine you're a hippo and here's this crazy baboon, an- baboon you might say, you know, if I stay in this uh, hippo energy for some period of time, which is not moving, which is, you could say, patience, balance, curiosity, openness. You know, I wonder if I actually embody the hippo if this baboon is going to calm down and become a, a kitten or a, a puppy or a dog. I can't believe they found that image. Have you seen this image? It is literally a hippo and a baboon. <laughs> How are they able to find this? You guys, next time, Molly, you got to wow. go full screen right away. Wow. I, I, we can't see it. We're so there's a, there, there is an imaginal or symbolic representation of what this confrontation was for you. Yeah. Now, you can think, does it change it for me? If I have, because it might create some empathy that I'm dealing with a baboon, and it's not to put him down, it's just that what kind of energy is he embodying? If you're a hippo, what are you embodying? And is there something that I can do now that I'm considering that we're different? Just a question. Well, I don't expect you to answer it now, but... Now, that's a so, lot to do in real time. It's a lot to do in real time. Right, and, and somebody's th- yelling at you. Yeah. Somebody's getting thermonuclear on yeah. you. Yeah. And I'm just doing my best not to respond in kind. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm a fighter. You're ready. I'm a fighter. Yeah. So when somebody punches me in the mouth, yeah. you can only do that so many times before like, all right, you want to drop bombs, boy? I'm going to take off the gloves right now because right. it's a lot of restraint. That's why I said I'm the hippo. It's like... I'm chill. This is going to be okay for a while, but then my tusks are going to come out. I'm yeah. going to rip you apart. I mean, that's fair. Right? That's so fair. I'm, I'm doing everything I can yeah. because as as you know, this whole match and mirror thing, as you're 
temperament and your anger rises, I, I start to follow suit. Yeah. And if you're calm, I try to be calm. Yeah. So I'm in this moment trying to be as calm as possible to say, man, this is not productive right now. I just, and I said it in almost the same exact way I'm saying it to you in this yeah. reenactment where yeah. I just don't think this is productive. I think we should end this call. I mean, that sounds let's, fair. Let's cooler heads That's, prevail. Let's regroup. I'm not saying I'm dismissing you, but n now it's just it's late at night. We're both yeah. tired. Yeah. And let's let's get off the phone before it's too late. Yeah. And they insisted. So then the hippo became the baboon. Yeah. Ultimately. Okay. And, and then we just tore each other apart. But okay. But it's not a fair fight. When you're the superior and there's a subordinate, it's not a fair fight at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of really great tools. Uh, we're loving this. Molly, you want I, to say something? Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, someone has a question. They asked, how do you control your emotional reaction slash ego when you're getting triggered by someone else's behavior? Perfect question. This is from the internet. They said, how do you control your emotion reaction when somebody else is exhibiting this kind of behavior? The exact same situation I was in. Yeah. Because you want to fight. When you're feeling well, why triggered. Do you want to, I'd say, why do you want to control your emotion? I mean, okay. what's wrong with fighting? Oh. Huh. Yeah. Everybody's different. Some people are going to fight. Some people. Oh, okay. You know what? what? That sounds a lot like your your mom saying, "Control your emotions. Stop that. Yeah, you're exactly. Like, stop it. Stop it." Now you're. It's saying, not okay. It's hey, not man. okay to be angry. It's not okay to punch back. It's not okay to hit a girl. You know, sometimes it is okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. I'm not chauvinistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it's like just, that. You know. Yeah. But you know, you're right because some people think they can get away with murder. They keep poking you and poking and poking yeah. you. And my two boys are like this. They're 13 and 11. They fight about the most inane things. Really just whatever. And then the, 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 the older one or the little one will poke, 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 and then they snap. And then they get punched. Well, I mean, what this culture seems to have trouble doing is telling the truth. Mm. So the truth at that moment is, so if it true. were me, I might say, you know, Billy, I'm getting really angry. I don't want to be angry with you. And when I get angry, I notice I either want to lash out or I want to turn away and I don't want to spend time with you because that's the honest truth. I'm angry. You could use I statements, what's, what's called I statements here. Tell me about this So, here, so here's, here's an idea mm. that is okay, very guys, useful. Internets, internets, <laughs> pay attention. We need a bookmark it, timestamp it right now, start date to 1146 or Wednesday, it's September 27th. <laughs> this is a tool. These, these are called the I statements, uh, the I rule. Go ahead. So I statements. Three, three statements. I am feeling blank. Okay. And fill in the blank. I am feeling blank. I was hoping for blank. In the future, I would like blank. So, so I'll give good. an example. Okay, okay. How, hold on, hold okay. on. I, I am want feeling to, blank. I want to say back. I okay. want to say back. I, Sorry, guys, I stepped out of light. I look really ugly when I step out of light, so I'm going to step back into the light. <laughs> I'm feeling some emotion. Right. <clears throat> I was hoping for some outcome. Right. In the future, I would like yes. this other thing to happen instead right. of what actually happened. Right. Okay. This so is I'll, good. I'll give you a real-world example. Okay, I'm working at a clinic late. Um, my wife hadn't worked that day, and we talk about 9.30 at night, and we... She says, you know, can you plan dinner and pick up dinner, and what are you going to get, and do it. And... I agreed, and as I'm talking to her and I'm thinking about it, I'm getting more and more angry. So I still... I, because you had been working all I'd day. I've been working all day since 9 a.m. to right. about 10, 15 at night, and she hadn't worked that day. And then she wanted you to pick up dinner? Sure. She, she said, you know, would you be... Since you're driving past this restaurant, we're like, would it be okay if you did it? And I said, okay. sure, and that wasn't really what I wanted to say, but right. said, okay. So I'm fuming. I'm starting to get more and more angry. Oh. So I get home, we're eating, and the typical response if you're not honest, is you didn't work all day. You should have known better. Why didn't you plan dinner? And you have to do this. Oh. It's all your fault. I'm angry because of you, 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 and you should have, and you didn't. The you statements. But that's not true. Blaming. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So here's where I statements come mm -hmm. in. I said, baby, I'm feeling angry. I was hoping you'd pick up dinner. In the future, if one of us doesn't work, let's talk about how we're going to do this. How can we support each other? Well, what was her response? Yeah, baby, I hear you. Wait, did you actually do this? I actually did this. Okay. Oh, it's this, a is real, this is like it's a real, real life drama. Hold on. You guys get the popcorn now? Okay, keep going. So it's real. <laughs> so it, it, it brought us closer together because she could hear me. She's mm -hmm. great at that. Uh, she is fantastic for being able to hear what I actually mean. And what does she do for a living? She's a, a, a customer. A she customer. Okay, she's a creative person. Movies, creative okay, person. Okay, great. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. So anyway, so I statement. So there was nothing I was blaming her for, putting on her, accusing her of, none of that. I was just sharing my experience, and that was the truth. The, the best truth that I know is what's happening inside of me. And 
it takes a while to learn the knack of doing I statements because we want to lash out and say our bad mood is because of somebody else. And that's just not usually true. Mm. It can be true in cases of trauma, but in general, you know, baby, I'm feeling angry. So she knows how I'm feeling. It's my feelings. I'm taking responsibility for it. I was hoping you'd pick up dinner. So I'm saying what I would have preferred. Me, you. In the future, let's figure out how we're going to do this together. Well, then I'm, I'm looping her in and including her. So that, you could say, it's much more honest okay. to use I statements than mm. to accuse somebody else. And I see this in practice all the time. And I statements are a backbone of beginning to actually speak truth to each other, especially in couples work. Great. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to do this the wrong way, and then I'd like to do this even worse like by channeling my child and okay. using this exact same framework. Let's see how I do. Okay. And then you, you judge me, okay? okay? So I'm gonna say I'm feeling, I'm hoping, and in the future I would like. Yes. I'm feeling, in this situation, underappreciated. I was hoping that you would recognize that I was working all day and that you would be able to help. In the future, I would like that, that if one of us is working these long hours, that we try to support each other in a different way. Yeah, yeah, that works. Okay. Yeah. It, okay. The first statement I'm feeling, if you can get more to a primal emotion, happy, sad, glad, afraid, envious, those kind of words, oh. it's more direct. Uh, a word like disappointed, you know, to me, disappointed actually means you're either hurt or angry. So just go straight there. So, and it's not easy oh, to do, Chris. Right. So this it. is, you have to practice these things because especially as men, we may not know how we feel all the time. We're not like trained <laughs> to tap into emotions, right? <laughs> right. It, depending on the cultural We were background, told to shut that thing down. Shut it down. Wait, Just be really excellent honest. at investments or whatever you're going to do, right? And being doctoring or lawyering or whatever. Right. Okay, let me do this like, like the way my 13-year-old son, he's, he's really mad at the other one, the yeah. little one. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm feeling like you're really annoying. I am hoping that you're less annoying. In the future, I would like for you not to be annoying. <laughs> That's how he would do it. Exactly. And I'm like, uh, buddy, this is not the intent of the, yeah. the I statement. Well, you could see what does your other son who's receiving the message do? He, he argues back. Of course, because he's being attacked and it's fair. Mm. He's being attacked. If your first son would say, I'm feeling angry, I was hoping you'd be nice to me. And in the future, I'd like you to be nicer to me. What's the issue? Nobody's being attacked. It's hard to do. Wait, say that one more time. Uh, I'm feeling angry. I was hoping you'd be nicer to me. And in the future, I'd like you to be nicer to me. <laughs> okay. Now, I got a question for you. Is that the I and the you, there's only one word separating those two things. Does the ideal version of this recipe not use the word you in there? Because I'm feeling you're annoying. I'm feeling, yes. I was hoping that you would be. So yeah. you're just adding two words in well front said. of the you. So well we got to strip out the you. You don't say you. You don't say you. you don't so say try you. your best not to say you. Yeah. Because as soon as you say you, you're asking for a fight. You're asking for somebody to respond to Yeah, that, and you're, accusi right? you're accusing somebody of doing something that bothers you, but it may not bother them or they may not even know they're doing it. So it's just an aggressive stance. It's like putting a sword in somebody. When you say it you is. did this and you made me feel that, it, in, it's not exactly true in general. People don't make me feel a certain way. They do something and I have a response to it and mm. I could respond to the same event with joy or happiness or I could be envious and hateful. But so that's that, on me, and that depends on a whole 56 years of training and mothering and being in real... I mean, there's a whole bunch of... It's impossible to actually quantify what's in there. But I know my experience is I'm getting angry. This is a, a concept I don't want to just brush over a little bit, you guys, because a lot of people will say... And they tend to point the finger at somebody else. Yeah. You're making me angry. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you are screwing me over. And then your, your thing is we got to take responsibility for how we react. Yeah. And this is something I would coach my entrepreneurs out there and, and, and people who accept a client for little money knowing, like at the beginning, they already know they're getting underpaid. Yeah. And so what happens is they're building up resentment. And then they blame the client. I have a cheap client. I have mm -hmm. a demanding client. They're so annoying. My my quickest thing to respond to that is who accepted that job under those terms? You knew what the terms were. You knew. And if you're angry, you could say, I'm angry. Someone's I asking. was hoping for a client with a bigger budget. In okay. the future, I'm going to say no to small budget clients. Okay, we had a question from the, the crowd here. Someone's saying, what if you can't even identify your feelings? Like, how do you even start the I statement then? Okay. So somebody in our audience is asking, 
I, I can't even recognize my own feelings. How do I even begin to put words to that? Well, like I think we said earlier, if you, listener or watcher, if you think, do I like this or I don't like this? So that's not a feeling. You, you, your feeling function, we, we have functions that we operate in life with. So the feeling function says, I like this, I don't like this. If you take in and think, I like this, or I don't like this, it sounds like something happened that you don't like. Well, I don't like this. Well, how do you feel about this thing? Do you, then you can start sorting through the basic ones. I feel angry, I feel hurt, I feel sad, I feel jealous. Uh, you could start questioning yourself. Um, it's also not a sad? bad idea to, to reach out to somebody who might have better experience or more facility with feelings. Mm. So Erica's wondering, what if you can't tell? I guess you you have a lot of people in our community that just don't know how to code any of this stuff. Yeah. Is there an exercise or a, a tip therapist. or a tool? Uh, Besides, here's my phone number. Give me a yeah, ring. Yeah, I think. <laughs> well, you know what? Let's do this, I, I, guys. Also, Molly, drop in Hugh's contact I, information. I did. I'll do it again. Do it again on Facebook and on on YouTube. Those of you guys that are in Los Angeles um, that want to work with Hugh because of his unique characteristics about who he is. But is there? A hotline for therapists or that you can call to vet no. people, nothing, Yelp of therapists? Uh, yeah, you could, I mean, there's what a lot you of, do? you can go to each, each, you can go to psychology today and read about thousands of therapists in your own town, in your own city. Mm -hmm. There's other sources, you can just go online and look up, you know, read my website and see if what I talk about vibes with you. And mm -hmm. most therapists have their own website, you could search that out. Mm. Yeah, there's I've... a deeper question of what do I do if I don't know how I feel? is, well, you could start noticing that, you know what, something doesn't feel right, but I don't know what it is. I wonder if there's a process or a book or a person who could help me understand what that is. Okay. Because there must be some kind of upset. So I have some advice, but Molly wants to say something real quick. Go ahead, Molly. No, I mean, this is to dive into, because I'm looking at Hugh's website, yes. and it says spiritual psychology, and I really mm -hmm. want to dive into that more. So if okay. you could just bookmark that. I'll, I'll pin that. Yeah. Okay, let me make a note. Molly's to saying time. that your website says spiritual psychology mm -hmm. that's doing all kinds of things for her. So she wants to make sure we circle back to that. <laughs> okay. Here's okay. my advice in, in case you don't know where to go. I would suggest that you look at the most well put together person or people in your, in your group and ask them, how did you get that way? And more often than not, more often than not, they've, they've, they've had a coach, they've seen a therapist and then asked for a recommendation. Look at the people who you look up to, who you mm. admire within your circle of friends, because the referral is going to be a really great resource for you. That's good. Because they know your That's personality, good. and different therapists have different styles. Right. Somebody's going to be a lot more aggressive and be very direct. Somebody's going to be a lot more passive, yeah. and all shades in between. Yeah, and I, just, I like that, Chris. And one thing I would add, too, is finding a therapist is like dating. You don't just go with the first one. You have to, I'd say, does the person seem like they get you, and do you like them? Mm. Very simple. And yeah. it doesn't always happen. Yeah. There's sometimes where you meet a number of people and something doesn't feel right and that's enough. Again, do I like this? Do I not like this? You know what? Do I like this person? Do I not like this person? And if you like them and they seem to understand you and they get you, mm. that's good. That's a good start. Mm -hmm. That what sounds very spiritual. <laughs> okay. Erica's saying like, what, can, what if you can't afford one? You have an answer for this. What well, if you can't afford one? Well, there's two, there's two ways to do it. One is most therapists have sliding scales even i have a sliding scale for people who can't afford it and there's clinics many clinics in most cities that have interns w very well trained interns who you can go to for a fraction of the of the fee well you said at a point after you finished your studies you had to do an internship exactly three and a half four and a half years three and a half that's a really long internship yeah, yeah. that's the mother of all internships. So you can see yeah. you get qualified people and you pay a fraction of what you would for somebody in private practice that's great so yeah. what would you search for if you're looking for that specifically uh, you can look up counseling centers therapy centers those are good uh, Google or search words yeah, whatever they're like thirty five dollars some of them your, in, yeah. very affordable. you could look up family therapy you could look up the symptoms themselves you can look up uh, help with depression you can look up anxiety mm. you can look up panic disorder you can look up whatever you think you're hosting <laughs> and something will pop up I guarantee somebody has right. done the legwork to make sure that 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 you know keyword is gonna pop up for their clinic so I'm going to be a little flip about this. I'm going to say after you finish going to WebMD and figure out your own maladies yeah, yeah. and psychosis, <laughs> yeah. look up that term. Yeah. You're self-diagnosing and yeah. you'll find somebody. Yeah. And the, the good news is this. I think 
with with a few exceptions most people in your field of practice are genuine people they're honest and they want to be there to help you with a few exceptions yeah and if you walk in the door they're like you don't suffer from chronic depression you're, you're going through this and that's not my specialty but i'm going to make some recommendations yeah. for you yeah there's right? there's times when you refer out because it's just not something you do yeah so i don't typically work with addictions and la is full of people who have that particular issue so i'll refer out Okay. let's say. And I don't necessarily work with eating disorders. So people who are experiencing that, I'd probably refer out to somebody who specializes in that. Yeah. And there's a whole gamut of So of basically conditions. you've ruled out Aaron entirely because he's got an eating problem. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing around. All right. You know what? This is really awesome, you guys. And I want to jump to the internet and kind of see the comments and questions they have and, and, ask. and respond. There's a lot of questions. So guys, I'm going to step out of the beauty light. It's a horrible, it's a sin. I know I'm going to step out of the beauty light for a moment here. I'm going to read some of the comments and then I'm going to throw them to Hugh. And before we go, how much time, are we okay on time so far, Hugh? Uh, yeah. We should probably wrap it up in a, a 10 minutes. 10 minutes, no, okay. Then we need hold a on, talk. hold on. Before we wrap it up in a few <laughs> okay. minutes, right. you guys, we're going to talk about spiritual psychology. And I still want to get to the bottom of this thing about how to help our community overcome this idea of money as it is associated with the work that we do. I can't let you go uh, before we do that. But That's I want to respond to the community. Okay, so okay. I'm going to pivot my desk out here. So I'm okay. going to step out of light. I'm going to read some questions. Molly, then, anything? Yeah, I mean... Okay. Should we talk about spiritual psychology? Okay, so while that, while I scan and read the comments here, yeah. why don't you just talk about what spiritual psychology means and how you practice that? Um, yeah, let's let's put it this way: the central experience of of each of us is not our thoughts or emotions or somatic experiences. Meaning, it's not the coming and goings. Because if we're clear and we watch what's happening, we can see that thoughts come and go. So we couldn't be our thoughts because obviously they come and go. And same with emotions. Emotions flare up and they go and they come and go. So neither one of those would be candidates for defining who we really are. Same thing with the body. Um, besides sickness or health or moods, we know that every seven years all the cells in the body are replaced. Uh, I think the brain is seven to ten years. So we are literally a different person somatically than we were seven years ago. So. If thoughts, we couldn't say we are our thoughts and we're not our emotions and we're not the somatic experiences that change and move all the time, well, what are we? So spiritual psychology would say, well, we're the witness, the awareness of the coming and going of thoughts. We're the witnessing of the emotions that come and go. And we're the witnessing of the changes in the body. So that goes back to some of the trainings I received in uh, the non-dual traditions of Tibetan Dzogchen and Hindu Advaita. Try to look that up. I did. <laughs> Somatic is a form of alternate therapy. So the central or the esoteric teachings or the, the whatever we want to call it, the central notion is always that there's a self to which experiences happen. Spiritual psychology would say the same thing. There is an authentic self to which experiences happen. You could also say we're a, we're a being that's having a spiritual experience. We could say that. But the deeper level is always, there's always a witnessing, there's always an awareness of a self or a being to which things happen. And to the extent that you can abide in that suchness itself is the extent to which you don't get pulled off course as much by emotions or thoughts or somatic experiences. So that's kind of in a nutshell, Molly, what, what that means. And in therapy, the way I do it, we, we always consciously or unconsciously work towards helping a person taste what is that in them that's the being itself. And what is it that keeps coming in and convincing them that they're this mood or they're this thought or they're this physicality. It's subtle work. And it's not for everybody. It's very difficult to even taste what this is that all the traditions talk about. I want to do it. But in a nutshell, that's kind of what what that is. I'll be calling you. Yeah. <laughs> Molly just said she loves it. She'll no. be calling you. Okay. <laughs> Good pitch. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, you have her eating out of, her, of your hands right there. Okay. So John is asking this question. Hugh, do you host live streaming sessions? I don't. No. No, the answer is... Duh, what are we doing right now, John? Well, <laughs> I mean, besides this, no, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Okay. And people ask me if I do um, Skype, and in the past I would say no because 
In therapy, the way I do it and the way I was trained is that there's, there's something that happens person to person when you're sitting with another person. And even if you're projecting that they're your, your father and the unlived things, if you can work through some of these things with the actual person in front of you, it's a very different experience when two bodies are in the same room interacting than on a phone call or a Skype or over some kind of third screen. And so my preference is just that I don't typically like to work that way. I'll do it with clients who live here and they're on vacation or they're out of, out of the country for a little oh, while. See. But typically, I wouldn't want to start uh, the process of psychotherapy with somebody that way. It's just not for me. Other people do it. Right. Okay. Let's get back into the thing that I think we, we got to try and solve. And then there's another question here about self-esteem and what we can do to improve that. Okay. And then I think we'll need to wrap up the show. Okay. So I'm a designer. Or I'm a creative person or I'm just a being in the universe. Yeah. And... I feel like when, I, when it comes to the subject of money, it becomes really uncomfortable for me to talk about. I, d I start to negotiate myself down from a price. I give advice to people to say, you should charge $5,000 to do a logo. And they freak out and they say, well, it's, uh, I'm only working on it for so... They, they're, they're giving the, the client all the ammunition they need because they're talking themselves down. A thing that I've said before is, designers are the, most, they're the best negotiators in the world negotiating against, For other, themselves. against themselves oh how yeah. do you how do you overcome this association with money and the guilt that comes with it like it, it feels dishonest if i only work on something for a couple of hours i should only charge an hourly rate is there anything that you can give to us or at least our community to think about well uh, i don't know i have to think about that okay i'll give I, you some time i, I think Look, one of the ways we used to do it is we would try to get a handle on if we would let's say we're doing the music and sound design who's the director who's the editor where is it being shot? And from those kind of questions, we could discern what kind of budget are they talking about? If it's an A-level, the most expensive director in the world at the time, and they're using the, the greatest editor who just did Gladiator, let's say, or some of these big movies, we know there's some bank. And we also know historically that we have a range that we typically work in. So back in the day, there was a certain price if you did a 30-second original music track with sound design, there was a certain price tag that seemed to be common among the industry. So one thing is turn to the industry and say, what's a common fee for something like this? What do other people typically charge? That takes out all the worry and anxiety and self-esteem and self-confidence issue and allows you to not necessarily host the, the fear. Mm. So it's one way that you may do it. That's the way we used to do it. Just to get a beat on what playground are we playing in? Is it Madison Square Garden or is it the local Sandlot? Those are all good, very, very good things. So the first thing I heard you say was this idea of a sliding scale. Yeah. And you have a range in which you're comfortable working in. Now, you obviously don't have any issues with saying, let's be at the top end of that sliding scale versus the bottom end. Mm -hmm. So for those of you guys that are struggling through this, charge whatever you feel comfortable with in your sliding scale, but realize there's a scale. And then to recognize, why is it a sliding scale? So I want you just to speak about your experience as a composer, sound designer in your previous life. What were the key factors? Can you just recap for us why you would go at the higher end and why you would go at the lower end? What would compel you to bring the price down? I think if it was a... Uh a very high profile campaign that didn't have a big budget, it would probably weigh more heavily for us as creatives and marketing people than if it was some something that was never going to see the light of day by anybody. Uh, it also depended on the people. I think we got hired because clients really liked us. We were like down to earth guys and we were no drama. Okay. And we did the music and sound design that everybody else did, but there was no drama, there was no tattoos, there was no nose ring, there was none of that. It was just down to earth people. and we attracted a certain kind of client. We didn't get the tatted up 25 year old creative teams very often because they wanted something else. But we got creative directors from all over the country who wanted a great experience who have been doing this for a while. And we started recognizing that our niche is probably that particular demographic. Okay. And that's almost always the kind of clients we had. Okay, so I'm gonna, ask humans. You, yeah. I'm gonna ask you a very real question here. I mean, I, I think I just lost that question, but maybe it'll come back to me the, the thing i wanted to say is this is that oh i remember now okay so what was fundamentally different between a twenty thousand dollar score versus a thirty five thousand dollar score for you 
Mm. W- were there any differences? Well, you're always more excited if you get paid more. <laughs> Your level of enthusiasm is yeah. Insane. Okay, this is you're this dancing is, up and down as opposed to I would have settled for twenty five and they had thirty five. Wow, <laughs> awesome! <laughs> Let's go look at BMWs. Right. I mean, you know, okay, it's a real thing, and that's okay thing. if you you can own that. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. So what I, you answered exactly the way I wanted but you to the re, answer because the reason for that if it, if the budget's twenty five as opposed to thirty five, you're still going to get the orchestra. Let's say it's yeah. the same orchestra. Same it, process. There's 40 people. You go to a big studio. You get the engineer. You do. It's the same exact process. Nothing would actually change. This is something that people in our audience have a really hard time believing, because recently I talked to our community to say we're charging eighteen thousand dollars to do a logo, and that's mind blowing for people. Eighteen thousand yeah. dollars. And then we recently closed a six figure logo assignment, and now their minds are just beyond blown. They're sc- they're still picking up the parts and pieces, and they ask me, Chris, mm. what is fundamentally different? between the $100,000 logo and the $18,000 logo? And the answer surprises them. Nothing. Yeah. Same quality, yeah. same thinking, exact same process. Yeah. And this goes into the thing that I believe you're saying, which is you price the client and not the job. Yes. You're hired to score something, but depending on the profile, the nature of the client, what they're trying to do, you're pricing the client. So you're super consistent with what I've been saying yeah. for quite some time. Okay. So check and check there. Okay. This is how it is. It's, this it's is how reality. it is. Now, the difference between a twenty-five thousand dollars score and a thirty-five hundred dollars score is a big difference. Mm. So at that point, you have to use synthetic strings and use samples instead of a forty or sixty-piece orchestra. I mean, you know from your own experience probably that that's a big difference. But once you've hit your mark and your expenses are covered and you know what your markup is and you've hit that, anything above that is just joy. Right, and I love that. I like that you describe it as joy. Yeah. Because other people describe it as guilt, that they don't oh. deserve the money, that they're not deserving of this amount. Oh, yeah. There's something else that you're saying that I want to just translate into like robotic business speak here, is that notice how when he was talking about a $35,000 job versus a $3,500 job, what did he do here? He's basically the creative process, your creativity, all that kind of stuff that's been locked into your brain, that's still there, that's still present. What is different is the expenses in which he'll attach to the assignment. He'll use synthetic strings and something on a keyboard, very digital. It'll still be really creative and amazing, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't fall into the trap. Well, they only have $3,500 this time. Let me call on my friends and get the strings and do the studio recording and then mixing and doing all that kind of stuff. You give them the best job that you can give them given the budget. And that's a key concept. Yeah. Right? Same for us. All right. Same I'm sorry, us. guys. I'm dragging this straight back into the business line here. This is all about psychotherapy and self development and spiritual beings and spiritual psychology. <laughs> all right. I think it is time to wrap up the show. Hugh, is there anything that we didn't ask you that something that you want to talk about before we, we let you get out of here? Actually, there was um, typology. Carl Jung started this by working at hospitals. And so, what I see a lot is people come in and they don't know what kind of type they are. So I just want to talk briefly about that. The difference between introversion and extroversion. So like I have a client, a female designer, and she's an introvert. Her family are extroverts. Now she grew up, she grew up feeling like an ugly duckling and she didn't realize until she had a handle on how she was threaded, what her temperament was, that she was entering the territory of extroverts as an introvert and it's a very different experience. And I would, I would put the difference this way. Two people are standing on a beach. There's a beautiful wave coming in. The extrovert grabs a surfboard, anticipates a really fun time, gets the suit on, gets everything, and runs into the waves, cackling and laughing, expecting to have a great time, and does. He's drawn towards the wave, or she's drawn towards the wave, towards the object, towards the thing out there that looks like it's going to be really fun or meaningful or whatever words. The introvert's a little different. The introvert might look at the wave and say, how do I feel about that wave? Or what does that wave mean to me? Should I be drawing the wave? I'm not sure. Let me just think, uh, see how the wave is hitting me right now so I could decide how I'm going to respond. So the introvert looks to the subject, the, the experiencing of the wave that's coming in, and looks inside to see what is it resonating with. The extrovert immediately gets drawn towards the object itself. So there's a big difference. So I just wanted to, there's a lot to, that goes with that, but a lot of people get caught thinking, oh, I'm supposed to be like an extrovert because it looks sexy and it looks more more fun and it looks like that's the way a, super, a person's supposed to be. Right. But that's not true. 
Mm. So, so, and it's harder to be an introvert in this American culture because it's so extroverted. Right. So for the introverts out there, I can tell you that the, the reality of your own experiences is, is, is just as valuable as somebody who's going out and conquering the world. But it helps to know that because it normalizes your experience and lets you know, I'm not some weirdo. Millions of people are just like this. And in fact, I want to be more, I want to learn how to be more myself. In your true power. In your true power. I love that. From where it comes from, which may not be out there, but it's probably somewhere in here. Way to thread the beginning and the end of the show together, like book, sorry, Mike, I can't, book ending this talk together because at the beginning you were talking about self-confidence and self-esteem yeah. and self-esteem is how we feel around other people and being around an extroverted culture especially in the united states we feel like the word being an introvert is a bad thing exactly and you're saying no it's not it's, it's a different thing yes and that's the normal yep that's your normal exactly and you got to be comfortable with that mm -hmm. so i guess the the goal in in some of the self-development work is to get your self-confidence rating to be the same as your self-esteem that you feel the same way about yourself as you do when you're around other people. And then start to raise both of those things, maybe. Yeah. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, I think when you, you actually- You seem uncomfortable. No, no, I, there's a lot here. I don't want right. to beat a dead horse or, or go into, take a left turn into some other area, but um, self-knowledge, the best negotiators I've ever met, the best business people, excuse me, <coughs> are the ones, or the best artists, were the ones who know, who know themselves the best. If you have great self-knowledge and self-awareness about your strengths and things you don't do very well, you bring that to every negotiation, you bring it to every event. So you know that I can't do that job, it's just, I can't afford to do that, and there's no emotional issue. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So self-knowledge, ability to be self-reflective on what you're experiencing is almost always the key in my experience to self-confidence. I love that. And on that, we're going to wrap the show. I want to, first of all, thank you for coming in. Thanks, Chris. And I yeah. think our audience got a tremendous amount of value. And oh, we're good. going to be bringing people just like you onto the show. And we're going to drop your information into the show notes right down below so you guys can look up Hugh. If you're in L.A. and this is vibing with you, you're feeling the energy, the aura around Hugh and the way he approaches things, definitely mm -hmm. look him up. And he, I, what he said, he's willing to work with you. He, he, every, like many therapists, he has a sliding scale. So if you can't afford it, maybe there's a way that you guys can work it out. And I also just want to say, you have amazing eyebrows. Look at this guy's eyebrows. Yeah, he Look does. at this. It's just a, I'm a little, they I got, done. I got brow it. envy you right now. You could borrow some. I'll, <laughs> I'll sell you some. What's it worth to you? It's, it's worth everything. Chris, we got some donations that I made a slide for. So. Oh, okay. Let's, okay. So Molly, we're going to wrap up the show. Molly is saying, here are the people who donated. Thank you. It looks nice. very professional, Molly. Thank you. Beautiful. Let's go full screen on that and then cut back to me and then we'll, I'll kick off the show. Thank you, you guys. Uh, Scientist X, I forbid you to keep donating. We, he says, I'm not going to donate anymore. I'm going to be a sustain, sustaining member. So I say, that's cool. And then every show we do, he keeps dropping more money on us. Thank you very wow. much, you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Okay, let's cut back. All right, here's what I want to say, guys. Thanks for tuning in. And I just want to remind you, you are not defined by your past. The future is what you make it. Roll the titles. <laughs>